Good morning, everyone. Nice to see many of you back here on today, on the Saturday morning. Um, welcome to all of you, and a special word of welcome to my good friend, David Ramaboka, who's representing the South African Maths Foundation, which is actually hosting this uh, program. We've been running the CN Koba uh, program, training program from the beginning of the year. Some of you might not know about it, um, but uh, we are giving special training to those who have qualified to round three, the last hundred. And I'm very glad to see uh, a fair number of you here this, this morning. Uh, before I go on, I just want to <clears throat> make a remark about a book which I will be referring to <clears throat> um, during the course of this talk and during other talks as well. Uh, can you see it on the screen? Yes, but if I can see it. Okay. Yes, okay. So uh, let's just, some of you are aware of it. Okay, this book is called 1000 Mathematics Olympiad Problems, complete with lessons and solutions, which <clears throat> I wrote for the South African Max Foundation. You can see their logo at the bottom. And um, I'm gonna make lots of references to this book. It's a big book, it's over 600 pages, and it's got a lot of information which will be very useful to you. And some of the things that we will be coming across, I'm gonna give you just references to this book. And uh, I will tell you, uh, you can go and look at the book um, and you'll be able to know more about that particular subject. I've asked David, to put the name of the link. It's being sold by the South African Maths Foundation. Those people who have been in the program have got a free copy, but uh, unfortunately the, the others will have to pay for it. Um, and I asked David to put it, uh, put the link in the, uh, in the chat column. David, have you, have you put that in already? I uh, know I will put the link now, but they should remember if you want to buy a book, you just need to register on our website. You can go through that link and register and then you can upload the book after the payment. Yeah, it's, it's an ebook. It's an ebook, so you can access it uh, online. Uh, but there is a process through which you are taken to pay for it. And once you do that, then you are given the... Um, whatever, the keyword or whatever to get in. All right, now with that, the purpose of this meeting is not to actually, you know, sell the book. I don't, I don't, I don't do that kind of a thing, but it's because I make, I'm gonna make references to the book and it will be to your advantage to have it in readiness when uh, I make reference to it. All right, so let's just go ahead now. We are going to continue with what we did last week. We. Yes, so uh, David. To continue, I've just uh, posted to you because I, can, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do to everyone. I think. Um, or you, or you send it to me? Yes, yeah, so you can send to everyone. Okay, I'm going to. I'm going to just put it. Yes. Now you got me now. Uh, it's like I'm locked. Uh, the oh. chat is open for directly to you. Oh, okay. Oh, All right. Um, okay, we'll do that a little bit later. No because, yeah, that's you, you're asking me to do things which I don't normally do. I don't know how to do these things. All right, let's uh, let's let's get on with the work then. I'll put that link a little bit later on the in the chat column. <clears throat> okay, we stopped here at question thirteen, and this is the thirteenth question in the two thousand eighteen paper. And it goes like this. It says, we define the digit product of a number as the product of its digits. And then you've got an example there. 
if you if you get the example take 327 for example the digit product of 327 is a product of the digit so you got 3 times 2 which is 6 times 7 is 42 so the digit product of 327 is 42 but if you take this digit product there's a zero here so this product will be zero as you can see right so the they say a digit product chain is formed by successfully creating the digit product of each digit product. So in other words, if you start with 327, for example, I'm, I'm going to go to the, to the whiteboard. Okay, so we are <clears throat> doing problem number 13. So if you take 327, for instance, the digit product for this is 42. That's the digit product. And the digit product of this is eight, right? Now, you can start with some bigger number, like for instance, you can start with two, seven, one, three, five, six, or something like that. Okay, this is a very big digit product. So if you multiply all these, you got uh, 14, 42, 210, 1260, and the digit product of this is zero. So you keep going until you come to the end, until you can't go anymore, and you can't go anymore when you have a single digit, right? So in other words, uh, you stop when you come to a single digit. And the question is, prove that no matter what number I start, prove that no matter what number I start with, this always ends. Prove that the chain, we call this a digit product, digit product chain, always ends. In other words, no matter what number I start with, eventually you keep doing this, you must come down to a one digit number. Now, this is a, an example of proof. And the idea is, like you will have no idea, I presume, how do you go around proving that this always ends? Your, your stance will be, you'll take a couple of examples and you show it ends. And you say, well, I think it's always going to end. That's not a proof. If you prove it for five or six examples, that doesn't prove it for all examples. You see? So that's what mathematics does. You're going to prove that no matter what number I start with, you know, the chain is going to end. All right. So the strategy is to show that if I start, to, this is a strategy. Strategy is to show that the digit product, let's call it digit product of n, any number, is any, is always strictly smaller than n. Like we saw here, if n was 327, its product is 42, which is smaller than n. Here, this is your n here in this case and the digit product is eight, which is smaller than n. So we want to prove that no matter which number you take, the digit product is always going to be smaller than the original product, no, the original number. Uh, let me take a simple case first. Let's, let's take a simple case. When I say simple case, uh, let's say for instance, let n be a three digit number. I'm restricting the question. I'm only, I'm, I'm going to prove this for three digit numbers, no matter what three digit number is. There are just a few of them, 999 of them, but we're going to prove that the digit product, uh, actually there are a thousand of them, um, that this will work 
the digital product of such a number is going to be smaller than the original. And then we can use that idea to prove it no matter how, how many digits you have. You can say n digits, n is a small letter. Okay, now if we start with a, B, a three digit number, so you are starting with a number like this, 100A plus 10B plus C, right? That's a three digit, any three digit number can be written like this, right? hundreds, tens units, and A is the hundredth unit, B is the tens unit, and C is the units unit. And we know that if you take a number like this, this goes into ABC, we multiply the three digits. Okay, now to show that the digit product of n is smaller than n, what I will do is I'll subtract this number from this number and see whether it is positive. If this minus this is a positive number, then we can conclude that this is bigger than this, right? Okay, so let me take the original number, which is 100A plus 10B plus C, and I'm going to subtract the digit product. And the question is, I'm going to ask whether this difference is positive. Right, so here you can see that the A is common here between the first and the last. So I'm going to just take out the A from 100 that one, and then that one, minus BC. All right, and you're left with 10B plus C. Those are the, the remaining part <coughs> of that expression. Now, we want to find out whether this is positive. Oh, by the way, our, our number, we, should, we, we can always assume that the number is a positive number. Your N is positive. Right. Zero will automatically end. So there's no need to worry about zero. Okay, now is this positive? Well, certainly this is a digit. So it's greater or equal to zero. This is a one digit number. And B is also a number which starts from zero. Zero, one, two, up to nine. So 10 times a positive number, this is positive. It could be zero, you see. So the only thing that we are left here with, the A is obviously positive. It's the first digit of your three digit number. And obviously it's a three digit number. This one here can't be zero, right? So A is strictly positive, right? That is positive. Now, what about this? Is this positive? 100 minus BC. Okay, guys, anybody wants to contribute towards this? This is a very crucial part of the, of the solution. Can you conclude? Uh, yes, it is. Mehmet, you say it is true. Yes. Now, why is 100 minus BC always positive? Uh, because we know that the biggest value when you multiply two numbers is 81, which is smaller than 100. That's right. The largest possible value that you can give for BC is 81, right? So the 100, all the others will be smaller than 81. So 100 minus this will be a positive number. Okay, now that takes care of it because now you've got a positive number plus a positive number plus a number which is strictly positive. So this is strictly positive. And if you take that number, your N, put this on the other side, you get is bigger than the digit product. See, ABC is a digit product. This minus this is positive. You know, the, the same technique can be used to prove any, for any N. The only thing is it becomes a little bit more abstract. Now, if you have an N digit number, for, so, uh, now, you know, you've got three digit number, you can, you can do something with it. But if you've got a number which has got n digits, see for three digits, you had 10 squared times a. 
is your first digit. So for n digits, you will have 10 to the n minus 1 times a. Right? And then that will be your first, the largest number. And then after that, you will have the powers of 10 come lower. So you reduce n minus 1 by 1 to get n minus 2. This is your 10 here. And you multiply it by the second digit. A is your first of your n digits. B is your... And then it keeps going on like this until you come to the last one. We'll just call it, you can call it anything. You can, we, for the time being, we'll call it C. Right. Now we know, as we saw before, that all these are positive. All these are greater or equal to zero. So this is your, your n digit number, right? And this is your n. Right? And like what we did before, we subtract from it the digit product of this. Now the digit product of this is a times b. But then you got a lot of other things here because you, you, you got a lot of digits, but the last one we have called it c. Right? So you are, so this is what we're going to calculate. And as we did before, we can take the a out. Right? And this becomes a to the a out and like what we did here now. And then you have 10 to the n minus 1. Right? If, when you remove your a here, and this part here, as we did in the a, b, c, we removed the a out from there and you left with b, c. So in this case, you're going to have minus b times dot, 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 C, because they, you got a product of the remaining digits. And as we saw before, the only thing we have to worry about is this part here is zero, A. That's the first digit of your n digit number. And you only bother about this. You see, it's almost the same argument. There we saw that B times C is less than 81. Now, that's nine squared, isn't it? So there, in, when you had a three-digit number, you had nine squared. So here too, you have the B times C, all, all these, right, will be nine to some power. But uh, I'm going to go into the next page. The 10 to the N minus one minus B times this. This has got N minus one digits, the original number had n digits, the a has been taken out. So, so this thing here, the highest possible value it can have, this is less than or equal to nine to the power of n minus one. Because b is smaller than nine, every, each one of them is less than nine and the n minus one of them. So you can see you got now, you got 10 to the n minus one minus, uh, so yeah, minus nine to the n minus one and that certainly is greater than zero because this nine to the power of n minus one is differently smaller than 10 to the n minus one. Like how we saw that 81 is less than 100. So it's exactly the same thing. And once again, now we have actually proved it because we've got the original number, the digit product now is smaller than this. So how do we finish it off? So we say the digit product is always smaller than your original number. So, so to finish this thing off, I can say, therefore, n is greater than, we'll call it, okay, digit product of n for any number. So what happens is that when you start with your n, you'll get to some number which is smaller than n. Let's call it n1, right? So n is greater than n1. This is the digit product of n. And now you, you take the digit product of that, and we saw that no matter what number you take, this thing's going to be greater than n2. 
And if you keep going down like this, no matter what number you start in, if you've got a decreasing sequence of counting numbers, it must finish at one digit, right? We don't care how long this chain is, but it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. There must come a time when it hits a one digit. Even if it comes quite smaller by only one unit, it'll, uh, it'll take some time to get there. You know, you come to 119, goes to 118, it doesn't happen, but but but, but it, no matter, uh, uh, as long as it's getting smaller, it must finish off at a one digit number. So that proves this. Okay, I'm just gonna, it, it, it's, it's a question involving proof. So, um, I know some of you are, um, you know, the, the, this is still the junior level. And at the junior level, uh, proofs are usually not given, but I hope you understood that argument. Now tell me by show of hands, how many of you have understood that argument? I've got it written down on the, uh, I've recorded it and I can send it to you so you can, you can go over it some other time. So I'm happy to see a, a larger number of people understood that argument. Now that, this is what you call a mathematical proof, you see? Because in the end we say, no matter what N is, the thing will end. That's a powerful statement to make. You are not proving by using a few examples and illustrating it, but you are proving it for all numbers. Right? And that's the power of mathematics, see? So, now if you, I'll just hold on here. If you look into the chat column, uh, do you see there anything there? Anything coming from me? Now? Still cannot see it? Prof, I think the meeting has been set up in a way that it's not a, a group chat. It's only a one-on-one. -on -one. So like only I okay. can send a message to you. All right. Okay. I think what I'm going to do it, 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 uh, all right. Let me just write this thing out. Oh, let's just hope it works nicely. Just wait. Um, well, can you see it now? I guess not, huh? Okay, I'm gonna write this thing down. It's H T T P S. It's a long thing, so just bear with me. And you can write with me. S A M F dot a c dot z a this is your math foundation website okay now there's a slash here and you got e n another slash oh it's not so bad here it says mathematics olympiad problems mathematics in full but there's a hyphen olympiad hyphen problems. Right, that's your full website number. If you, if you uh, put that on as a link and click on it, you'll go straight to the page where you can purchase the book. Okay, uh, it's not so difficult. It's the only thing is that slash en slash this. Have you all got it? But at the end is mathematics dash Olympiad dash problems. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, Andreas, you, you sent something to me, but you, you're missing out the dashes. 
Make sure you put the dashes. All right, let's let's go on now. We're going to get on to the new, get on to the second problem, which is problem number 14. Okay, so I've, 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 okay. Now, this is problem number 14. Can you see it, problem number 14? Yes, Paul. Right. Now, in this problem here, again, once again, I'll just explain it to you instead of going through all this, I'm going to assume that you already have gone through this thing. Uh, and what you've got here is seven, 14 dots here. You've got a number of dots seven in one row and another seven directly below that in another row. And two people are playing a game now. It's a game between two play people, right? Suppose you are playing with somebody else. Now, how does the game go? What you have to do when it's your turn is to draw a single line which connects a dot. Say like that, connects two dots, right? You don't collect, connect two dots which are adjacent to each other. So you can, you can connect those dots if you like, but not diagonally, okay? So you're allowed to connect only two dots. Then the other player plays and he will connect any two dots. And then it's your turn now, and you do the same thing. Now, There'll come a time when you will have a situation like this maybe. And there is only one place left to connect. And that is this one here. I'm just saying at the end, you may have come to a situation. And this is the only one that, in which case you close the house, right? So now here, the person who closes the house And the person who closes the house loses. So in other words, you must play in such a way that you want the opponent to close the last house. All right. Now the question is, suppose you are the first player. Is there a strategy that you can have which forces a win. In other words, you're the first player, you can draw a line here and draw a line in such a way that no matter what, how the game progresses, you will always win. Your opponent will be the first to close the house. So now this is problem number 14. I'm going to give you the solution to this because this kind of problem occurs quite often and there is, there's no general rule, but the uh, there is one particular rule which is applicable in many cases. And it's the rule of symmetry. What the first player does is that he creates a symmetry. By symmetry, it means he does something which creates two identical situations, identical configurations for the in the game. And then now you, you take it and you create something, you do something and you create two identical configurations. Now it's the opponent's turn. He does something and you do exactly the same thing on your side because it's identical. Then he will do something else and you do exactly the same thing on your side, right? 
And eventually, he will have to close up something because he has something and you got the last move. You see? Like, like in this case here, yeah, how many moves are there altogether? How many, how, how, how many moves can you make altogether? You, you, you got seven dots. Actually, yeah. 19 moves all together. 19, all right. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six horizontal. Good, Andreas. You got another six here. That makes 12. And then you got seven vertical. So there are 19 moves all together. Right. So if you make the first move, right? If you make the first move, then the 18 moves left, right? So that guy makes the second move. And he'll make the fourth move. And he'll make the sixth move. So he will make the 18th move. And the 18th move, he would have closed the game because it's, it'll be symmetrical. And I will close the game on the 19th move on my side. Okay, so so the, 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 so which move would create a totally symmetrical situation in this configuration? All right, maybe you don't understand symmetry. So I'm gonna say what we will do here is now this move here. Suppose I do this, there are seven here. So I'll take the middle one, the fourth one and join it. Now you can see I've got exactly the same configuration on both sides, right? So this is my move. And the opponent, what he does is that he will do something, right? He, he, he plays red. And then I will say, now I do exactly the same thing, but I do it on this side. Whatever he has done, I do this. See? So he can do whatever he likes. I do exactly the same thing. Right? So in the end, he can play on either side, of course. He can play here, but then I will do, play on the other side. So you, you uh, in, in the end, you will have the last move. That is the point. And therefore, he would have, because it's symmetrical, he would have closed something before I would have closed it. Or right, you can you, you can try it out with somebody and you will see that it works. All right, so that is the a game. They often give you a game like that to, to ask you to describe a strategy that will make it that will make it win. Even in the 2019 paper, there is a question like that. Okay, now I want to go on to the next uh, question. So I'm going to get out of my whiteboard into the last question. The last question in this thing. I think it's that. Okay, can you all see the question? Yes, Prof. Yeah. Now, this last question, it goes like this. A computer outputs the values of the expression n plus one times two to the power of n whenever you plug in n or one or, one or two or three and so on. So it outputs it. Let's just look at an example. Like for instance, now, if you are, if you input one, if one is the input, uh, let me just get my black color back. If one is the input, then the computer takes one, n is one, one plus one is two times two to the one, n is one, that gives you four. Right. And if you try two, the computer will make it two plus one is three, three times two squared, because n is equal to two. Okay, I won't simplify it. N equals three gives you three plus one is four 
times 2 cubed. I like that now. 5, 4, 5 times 2 to the 4th, and so on. Okay. Now these numbers here, if this number here, for instance, is 12. This number is 32. This is 80. Now the question is, what is the largest number of consecutive values of n? You, you actually mean of n. That are perfect squares. Now, this is a perfect square, but this is not a perfect square, right? So these two consecutive numbers, consider values for n, they don't give you perfect squares. So you've got, it's quite possible that the largest one is n. You'll never get two squares next to each other. It's quite possible, right? And then if you have, uh, then if you can get a two, then you ask yourself, can, can you get a three, right? And then if you can, then you ask yourself, can you get a four? And it may be possible that, okay, you can never get four consecutive numbers being squares, then you will say the largest value is three. So that's the question. What is the largest number of consecutive values of n that are perfect squares? So the question itself, you know, requires a, a bit of understanding. Now I'll just show you, if you come to seven, all right, tell me what you get for seven. Eight times two to the seven, right? And eight, uh. and eight is, put eight inside here, I got nine times two to the eight. And these are consecutive numbers. And if you look at this, this is two cubed uh. times two to the seven. So that's two to the power of 10. And this is three squared times two to the eight. So when you factorize it, you'll see it'll get two to the 10, and that is certainly a perfect square. It's a square of two to the five. You see? So when you put in seven, the output is eight times two to the power of seven, which is 32 squared. And this thing here, this is also a square here because two to the eight is 16, two to the four all squared. So this is 16 squared times three squared, and this is equal to 48 squared. So these, both these numbers are squares. So you can have two consecutive numbers which give you squares, right? So it's possible that two is the largest number of consecutive values. Provided there is nothing which has got. Uh, yes. Andreas, Andreas, can, you, can, can I please ask you again? When I finish, then you can come back and I'll come back to this place here and you can ask me your question, okay? Please don't disturb me while I'm in the middle of trying to say something. I'll give you a chance immediately after this. Okay, so here you've got Seven gives you 32 squared, eight gives you 48 squared. So you got two consecutive numbers, which give you perfect squares. So it's quite possible that the answer to this problem is two. That's the largest number of consecutive values, provided that you don't have three consecutive values, which gives you uh, squares. All right, so now the question is now, how do you, how do you deal with this problem? Now, I just want you to notice that when n is even, the two to the n is already a perfect square. Now, this is a square, this is a square, and this is a square. In all these cases, n is even, right? So if you want for n, for n to be even, if you want this to be a perfect square, this is already a perfect square, then you'll need the other number to be a perfect square, you see? When n is even, this is not a perfect square because three is not a perfect square. So that rules it out. 
this thing here is not a perfect equation. Five is not a perfect square. But when it came to eight, it was acceptable because nine is a perfect square. You see? So when n is even, you have, you can identify, you can make some statement as to when is this product a perfect square. And likewise, when you look at when n is odd, we'll have to find out what happens in that case. If n is odd here, you will see that you can take out one of those twos from here, and then you'll have two squared, right? That's the perfect square. But when you take it out, you have to merge it with that. And then you ask whether that quantity is a perfect square. Two times that is a perfect square, see? So when you take out the two from here, you get two squared here. When I say take it out, I mean, I, I factorize this as two times two squared. Then you get eight times two squared. That is a square, but eight is not a perfect square. The reason why this worked was because when you take out this two from here, you'll have two to the sixth here, but two times eight is 16, and 16 is a perfect square. That is why this worked, see? So these are observations we make. And now when you try to prove it, it becomes, it becomes much easier to understand the proof. All right. So as we said that in this um, round four, I mean, this uh, round three, you have to prove things. So we have to take two cases, n odd, uh, n even. That's the easier case. We want to know whether n plus one times two to the n is a perfect square. Right? So, <clears throat> now, there's an important fact in mathematics, when you have an even number, that's a statement, you can translate that into an equation, right? And when you're proving things, you will always do this. Now, you'll say, let, when n is even, you can write it as an equation, n equals two times something, right? So the, the expression n is even can be translated into an equation because then you say n is equal to two times this, right? So now we want to know whether this is a perfect square. So you got two k plus one, n is two k. And this thing here is two k. can write that as 2k all squared. Now, we want to find out when is this a perfect square? I'll put ps to stand for perfect square. As we saw before, this is already a square. So it means that 2k plus one, I'm sorry, 2k plus one is a perfect square or is a square, right? So I can write this thing down as say m squared, where m is an integer, okay? So our, our discussion led to this thing here, the 2k plus one is m squared, but I want to say something about n. Therefore, n, what, what can you say about n for this to be a perfect square? That means n is equal to 2k. So this is your n, right? So what is n equal to? n is equal to m squared minus one, right? n is equal to m squared minus one. where m is actually an odd number because m squared is 2k plus one. So this is not any, any uh, number, it's an odd number, see? So it's a square of an odd number minus one. So we, 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 when n is even, then n has to be like that. It's of the form m squared minus one. If we, if you go back to the uh, go back to my 
square thing. Oh, what happened to this? Um, it's, it's got all wiped out. Sorry. You see, for instance, if m, if you take the odd number m to be equal to 3, right, that's the odd number, then n is 8, and we saw that it worked for 8. See, for this odd number here, that became a perfect square. Right. But now we've got a general one. We, the, the, the next one would be when m is equal to 5, and then n is 24. See, it goes quite far now. It'll take a long time before we come to substitute 24. So we are saying that when n is 24, this becomes a perfect square. So n equal 24 gives you n plus 1 is 25 times 2 to the power of n. n is 24. And there you have it. This is certainly a perfect square because this is 5 squared and this is 2 to the 12 all squared. So the general rule, whenever n is even, is that it must be a square of an odd number minus one. So let, let's, let's find out what happens when n is odd. Okay, now, as I said, this time you'll write it as say uh, two L plus one. I'll make it R plus one, two R plus one, right? An odd number can be written as one plus an even number. So you can translate that word n is odd into an equation. And now we want to see what happens to n plus 1. Times 2 to the power of n. So what happens here is that n plus 1 is 2r plus 2. Times 2 to the power of n, which is 2r plus 1. Now the two comes out here. So this is two into r plus one. So this is r plus one times two to the power of, and when, the, when, you, when you multiply this by two, you get two r plus two. The index increases by one. And yes, this is a perfect square. And you want this to be a perfect square. So, this is a perfect square, PS, provided R plus 1 is a perfect square. You see, this is already a perfect square. Now, this time you want R plus 1 to be a perfect square. You can call it, uh, running out of letters, S squared. Right. So, now to go back to your N now, you have to retrace your steps to see so what does n become? r plus 1 is s squared. What is n? He said n is 2r plus 1. So n in that case is 2r plus 1 and r plus 1 is s squared. So it's 2s squared plus 1. So when n is odd, right, it has to be of the form twice a square number plus 1. Now we saw that
sorry, I'm just thinking about this. Uh, I have a problem because we saw that n equals seven uh, allowed this thing to be a perfect square, but uh, this formula doesn't give you n equals seven. That is why I'm a little bit worried about this. Um, when n is seven, when r is three, and r is three, then you get, this is four, you get n equals nine. Uh, Anyway, I'm not sure what's going on here. All right, now I'll proceed with this. This, this, this is just to uh, illustrate it's not, uh, I don't think it's gonna worry me too much. So let's get to the actual cut it's, of the matter. Uh, so if you're, let's take the case where your N is odd. I'm gonna assume now, suppose You've got three. Suppose you've got three consecutive squares. Squares. Right, now we saw when n was odd, the first number will have to be looking like m squared minus one. Right, and then the next number we saw was two s squared plus one. Although I think there is something, some error there. And uh, the next one, uh, the, the, you see, if this is odd, then this is. Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, we are taking the even case first. Oh, we are taking the even case. All right, so it's two S squared plus one. Um, let's just get to the next page. All right, and then you'll have another odd here. This is even. The first one will look like this, the second one will look like this, and the third one will look like this. And these are consecutive numbers. But these are consecutive odd numbers. These, these are odd. The, the M is odd and N is also odd, right? Okay, so what does this mean? It means that if they are consecutive, it means that n squared minus one is equal to m squared minus one, this thing here, plus two, right? This is your first even number, then the odd after this, so this is two more than that. So you get a situation like this. This is m squared plus one. So if you simplify this, you'll have that n squared minus m squared is equal to one plus one, which is two. Right. So in a situation like this, if you've got three consecutive sequences, you will have, then you can find M and N such that M squared minus N squared, N squared minus M squared is two. Right. Now, is it possible that the difference between two squares is equal to two? When you look at the square numbers, the square numbers are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so on. And if you take any two squares and you subtract them, you can never get two. The smallest possible difference you can get is three. Right? 
if you allow zero, you can get one, right? So this, this is impossible. It's not possible to find N and M that works here. So therefore, this assumption is false, namely that you can find three consecutive uh, squares, right? So you can't find three consecutive squares for N is even. And likewise, if N is odd, you have a similar situation. This time you'll have something like two S squared plus one in front, and then that's your odd, and then you will have, this is your even square, and then you got something else here, two T squared plus one, right? And you'll see that, again, the same kind of an argument, this thing here, you have to add two to get to this, and then you'll come to the situation where T squared minus S squared is actually equal to one in this case. Right, when you try it. <clears throat> and again, the only time you will have that is when you are right there, which means that S is zero and N is one. Right. So, so shouldn't the equation for N is odd be two S squared minus one and not plus one? Uh, two S squared minus one, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, that'll give me my seven, eh? Yeah, yeah, now, but why do I get two S squared plus one? Yeah, thanks, who said that? It was Joanna. Joanna, yeah, okay, John. No, you, you're quite right. I, I suppose we get two S squared minus one, but somehow my calculations led to a two S squared plus one. I'm not gonna go and backtrack that. Maybe you can go and check to see why, where I went off. The two S squared minus one will give me my seven. You see two S squared, seven is certainly two times two squared minus one, see? So that gives you seven. But two S squared plus one doesn't give it. But as it turns out, this argument doesn't, doesn't fail because then you have minus one and you still have the same equation, T squared minus S squared equals one. All right, so that takes care of the, the last problem in 2018 and as you can see, it was a very challenging problem. And this problem would identify the top 10. Students in the country. I'm sure there would be one or two people who've actually proved this thing, like the way I proved. I wouldn't be surprised. And the top candidate might have got it. Anyway, <clears throat> whatever it is, that is the end of that. Okay, thanks, Joanna, for, for, for finding out what my error was. And you can go and check to see. I'm going to give you the solutions. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to send it to you. I didn't send it to you because I hadn't finished the last three. So I didn't want you to get the solutions before that. Okay, now let's get on to the 2019. That's the next um paper, this should have been a session. So we've already spent one hour on those three problems. Uh, I don't mind taking it a little bit easy because even if I do only two papers in four sessions, that's fine because there's a lot of things that I can tell you, a lot of interesting facts about mathematics which will be useful. Okay, so let's go on. <clears throat> Determine all integer solutions to this determine all integer solutions to this equation. Okay. Now, by that you mean, for which integers x will this be true? Which integers x will this be true? Well, if our x is going to be an integer, then the square is also going to be an integer. So you will have that, uh, see I've got a new solution. I had two solutions already and now while I'm talking to you, I've got a th third solution, which is even easier. Um, so what are the possible values for X minus two all squared? The possible values for X minus two all squared are 
it's an integer, x is an integer. So um, it's a square which is greater than one, so it's gonna be four, two squared, or three squared, or four squared, that's all, right? And then these are the possible squares. So x minus two is gonna be a square, so it's gonna be plus or minus two. Right. X minus two is, squared is four, so x minus two is either two or minus two, plus or minus three, or plus or minus four. And that gives you, that's x minus two. So x will give you, you have to add two to every one of these. So you can add two plus two, two minus two, two plus three, two minus three, two plus four, two minus four. So those are the only solutions. So the, the important thing is that you're not finding all solutions, only integer solutions, which helps you a great deal because then you know that this is a square of an integer and there's just the only three numbers which you have to take care of. And then the, immediately you got the equations. Now, I didn't say this and I gave you, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm gonna show you what I, what I did. You'd be shocked. Look what I did here. I did something very complicated. But anyway, this was useful. I also wanted to say something about graphs. Unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to say it now because I found such an easier solution. But maybe at the end, we'll come back to this one here and that will give you a good lesson on graphs. You know, to tell you what graphs are all about. Okay, but for the time being, we're gonna go on. I'm not gonna waste any further time. Let me just see. Yeah, there were six solutions. You can see at the, at the bottom. So. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this proof. See, I've got even another complicated proof here. So I had all these um, complicated proofs. Didn't see this nice, easy solution. Okay, now the next one. <laughs> You've got a, a table like this. They call this a multiplication table. There's a multiplication sign here at the top. So what, what they do is that they put numbers in the extreme left-hand side and numbers on the top there. And then you multiply to get any number here, take 60 for instance, this number, let me just get me my pointer If you look at 60, the number on the extreme left, right, and go to the top of this, that these two numbers are multiplied to get 60. This is what they are saying. That each number is obtained by taking the product of this number and that number. For instance, the product of this and that. What is the product of this and that? Can anybody tell me? 10. The product of this number here and that number. What's it? It's a 10. Right, 10. 10. Very good. Now, what is the product of this number here and that number? This one and that one? 24. 24, right. Okay, so you, you got the idea. So you've got the, uh, this is how this table is constructed. And they ask you to calculate all these numbers here, A, B, C, D, E, and uh, they ask you to work out the sum of this. Unfortunately, I actually found that, um, 
this problem had an error in it. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to speak about the error. We'll just uh, gloss over it uh, when we do this thing. But I just want to point out some important things here. You see, I've got, if you start examining the table, you've got, you've got 20 and 10 in one column here, 20 and 10 here, and so on. And there is one place where you've got 40 and 56. Right. Now, if you look at the N, this N here is going to be a factor of 40 and also 56. Because something times N equals 40, right? You agree. So N is a factor. There are a lot of, uh, 40 has got a lot of factors. But it's also a factor of 56. So it means that N is a common factor of 40 and 56. It's a common factor. Right? Now, what these people were doing was actually finding the highest common factor. But I'm going to um, in this particular case, it's possible. You see, so the n is the highest common factor of 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 n is eight. Now, every common factor, now listen to this, very important. Every common factor of two numbers is smaller than the highest. Because that's the highest, right? So HCF means highest common factor. So every common factor is smaller or equal to this, right? But more than that, it's a factor of eight. Now that, the teachers don't tell you that. Right? The highest common factor, every common factor is not just smaller than eight. Every common factor is going to be a factor of eight. So it's going to be, the, the, the common factors are only one, two, four, or eight, because those are the factors. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the point is now, the M itself is a, see, so for, for, from this, we got that n is less than or equal to eight. That's what you're saying. It's smaller than the small highest common factor. Now, if you look at m, it's a factor of 15 and 40. What's the conclusion? n is equal to five. You say m is equal to five. But what about one? One is a factor of 15 and 40 as well. You want to say m is less than or equal to five, isn't it? Hmm? It's a factor of five. So our first guess will be m is equal to five, but it can be one. Right, but now observe that m times n is 40 m times n is 40. Now, if you want n to be smaller than or equal to 8 and m less than or equal to 5, right? the only way you can get m times n is equal to 40 where if n is equal to 8 and m is equal to 5. See? So, okay, and actually there was no mistake. When I, uh, the mistake was mine. All right, so if this is five, what, what will this be? Three. It'll be three. Right, okay. Is there anything else that you can get? If this is eight, so this has to be seven, huh?
because seven times eight would be 56. Okay. And like this now, you can go around trying to fill this thing. Um, the only thing is now when you when you do the others, you you cannot. Uh, yes. Next to the eighteen, that can be an six. This one here. The eighteen one eight. Next to it can be an six. Right, so this is this is a factor of 18 and is a factor of 60 as well. Right, but, but the best, best you can do is you can say it's less than or equal to 6. Well, from 3 times 6 is equal to 18. So it has oh, to be 6. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, Andreas. So there's a 3 here. Okay, so we, we could have filled that in. All right, okay. So if this is six and this is 60, this is 10 here. And if this is 10 and this is 20, this is two. All right, so this, this whole thing can be filled now. Okay, thanks for that, Andres. So, you, so, so because that is a three, this has to be a six. All right, so I, I was mistaken. I thought that um, they're taking the HCF in every case, but it's only in this case here that you can prove that N is equal to eight and m is equal to five. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Uh, we, 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 we can fill in all the numbers. Uh, okay, but we still have these. So here you've got a number which is a factor of 20 and also a factor of four. So it's less than or equal to four. This number here. Awesome. Yes. Okay, I but then we have a two next to the ten. So it has to be a five. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm missing all these. In my old age, I have become a little bit short sighted. Okay, so you got five and this is four. All right, now you agree. And this thing here, what will this be? This has to be a six. Because there's a four here. And now you agree, this entire row has been filled. Therefore, you can work out all the A, B, C, D, E, right? Agreed. But now you, you got everything. And you can calculate the sum of these and it gives you 161. That's the answer. You can go and check it out. All right, thanks very much. You, you guys have helped me to solve this problem. I thought there was an error in this, but actually there wasn't. Okay, so that's question two. We'll go on to question three. Ah, oh, question three, we've got a geometry problem. All right. Match sticks are arranged as shown. So you got all match sticks, identical match sticks, I presume. So they all got the same, all the blue lines are all equal in length. So you got a lot of nice geometry here. Um, and um, So can we make any conclusions? All these are identical, so you would agree that all these sides are equal. Like that. 
So now prove that A, B, and C are in the same straight line. I think they should have said that this thing here is a square. Can we conclude that this is a square? Not really. But if you were the dust, even if it were to move, it would still be able to you would still be able to get a straight line. Hmm. All right. Okay. Um So now the problem, the problem is to show that A, B, and C, the line, the same straight line. Now, how do you show that? To show, I can join A and B. I can join B and C. And to show that all, the, all of them lie on the same straight line, you need to show that the angle at B, and this is very important, the angle at B, this whole angle here is 180 degrees. Right. So, which is the same as saying that we need to show that these angles add up to, these three angles add up to 180 degrees. Now, we already know one of the angles. Which one do we know? Uh, the 60 degree angles. Right, Mohamed, that's correct. So, this is because it's an equilateral triangle. Here. And then we can calculate one of the other angles that be fluid like an isosceles triangle where the angle which is starts one of it is 30 degrees like right or uh, like that yeah but but andreas when so i said to be a square yeah that is why i'm asking do we know that this is a square yes tell me why because all it, the sides are equal but that could be a rhombus. Wouldn't be and square. It could also be a rhombus. And but then if the rhomb like one of the sides were to lay on B, which is connecting triangle C to square A, then it would be a straight line. No, you can't argue that way. You, you have to use the given information to prove that this is 90 degree, that this is uh, a square. I I, I think. They should have said this is a square. I I, I can't see why uh, why it is a square directly. We can make we can make all these sixty here. Oh, I think they should have said it's a square. Okay, let's just assume it's a square. So then it becomes not so difficult. So if this is 60, what will this be? 30. And what will this be? 75. 75. And this will be? 30. 30. Well, then I can see an equal. If it were to be straight line, there would be an equilateral triangle. You can't assume it's a straight straight line. You want to prove mm. it's a straight line. So you need to show that these three but angles add up to 180. Can you calculate Otherwise this angle here? Can... There's an isosceles triangle here, you see? These are equal. And this angle here is 75. That is 90, right? So what will this be? Please. Because this is isosceles. Yeah. Right? So now when you add up these three, um, what do you get? That way. You get uh, 180. Uh, look, that is assuming that it's a, a square. Then we can prove it, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to see if it's not a square, if you don't know it's a square, whether it will still work. 
if you were to basically remove two at the 30 degree, first 30 degree, and then we, that would mean that where the 75 world would be removed one, then after that will the other 30 world would have been added to, which would then, and then it would then lead to that the weather one for, the, yeah, okay, for that angle was yeah okay now yes. we are we are not going to assume that this is 30 yeah, degrees no. we're going to give a name to this thing here and see whether it will still work right okay i'm going to call this angle here 2x i don't know it's i don't know that it's 30 right now i got this is isosceles this is now if this is 2x we know that this is a rhombus, right? So the opposite angles are equal. In a rhombus, the opposite angles are equal. Okay. Now we can calculate this angle here in terms of x because it becomes 90 minus x. Because uh, this is 2x. The other two will add up to 180 minus 2x. So each one is 90 minus x. And we need to calculate this angle here. And um, uh, it, it's, it's not going to be possible. Yeah, it's not going to be possible. In the rhombus, you've got too many angles. So I think they should have said that this is a square. Uh, and in any case, we proved it. In the case of a square, we added the, all the angles of 180. And I suspect that even if it's if, if it's not a square, then it's not going to be that easy to prove. Uh, um, so six. Wait, but it can still be proved. I, I don't know that these angles are equal here. See, we don't know these angles are equal because you've got a, a rhombus, the adjacent angles need not be equal. So this has got something out there. All, all we can say is that this is 60 minus 2x. Okay, this is 60 minus 2x. Because these two add up to 180. So you got 60 plus 2x, you got a 60 here. So this is 60 minus 2x, all right. In which case, um, in which case this angle here is 180 minus 2x, 120. This is 60 minus 2x, so this whole angle here is 120 minus 2x. And this is an isosceles triangle. So all the angles will add up to, uh, 180. I'm sorry, this is looking very bad. Let me just, clean this thing up and tell you what I'm doing. All right. Now, this is what I'm doing, guys. There's a 60 here, right? Now, this is 60 plus 2x. Now, this is a parallelogram here because all the sides are equal. In fact, it's a rhombus. So, the co-interior angles, this is 60 plus 2x. So these angle, that angle plus that angle gives you 180. So I've got, the only way you've got 60 plus 60 plus 60 is 120 plus 2x, right, those three. And this, when you add it to this, you're gonna get 180 degrees. So what must I add to this to get 180, minus, 180 degrees? I have to add 60 minus 2x. So this angle here is 60 minus 2x, right? Now, this angle here is 60. We already know that. Okay. So, this angle is 60 minus 2x. So, those two angles together is 60 plus 60 minus 2x, which gives you 120 minus 2x. Right. But now, this is an isosceles triangle. And you got this angle here is 120 minus 2x. These are equal. So what must each of them be equal to? I'll tell you that they both must be equal to x plus 30.
then only would you have x plus 30 plus x plus 30 gives you 2x plus 60 and 2x plus 60 when you add it to this you'll get 180. So the angles here are 90 minus x plus 60 plus x plus 30. And lo and behold, minus x plus x cancels. 90 plus 60 plus 30 is 180. So even if you don't know it is a square, you can prove that this is a straight line. And I think this is the, what they expect you to prove. This, if you, if you assume it is a square, they'll give you half, a mark, half the total marks. But it's only question three, it's unfair to give this rather difficult question so early. So, uh, so guys, it can be done, even if it's not a square, if it's a rhombus, that thing is still a straight line. But in the case of a rhombus, I don't know what this angle is. So I give it a name. The reason why I call it 2x, the reason why I call it 2x and not x is because otherwise I'm going to have halves here. I don't like to work with halves. If you put 2x, then you've got 180 minus 2x, and that, when you have it, you get a nice number, 90 minus x. Otherwise, I'm going to have x over 2 and so on. So it's better to call this thing 2x. All right, so that is the solution to that problem. I'll have to go and correct my solution because my solution was wrong. So next problem, uh, let's just pause then. Do you think you'll be able to do it in the general case? Put your hands up if you think, if, if, if it was not a square, if it is a square, it's not very difficult to prove it, as we saw. In fact, if it is a square, then it's a round two problem. Right? But the fact that they don't tell you, they just tell you all the sides are equal, they don't tell you there's no way in which you can actually prove that thing is 90 degrees. I don't think so. Unless you, you guys can try it and see whether you can prove it's a square. But I couldn't. But I, I proved it. nonetheless that even if it's not a square, and if you call that other angle uh, something else, give it a general name, these x's will cancel and at the end you get, get 180. Uh, tell me now whether you'll be able to do this on your own. Put your hands up. If you to try it out on your own and do it, give a full proof. All right, there are some people who feel quite confident that they'll be able to repeat that proof. Okay, excellent. Let's go on to the next problem. Oh, this is an alphabetic. The um, we did we did one of did one like this in the twenty eighteen paper. They give you another one, in the twenty nineteen paper. So the the alphabetic is this is his claim. Nice little sentence. Okay, let's try to solve this alphabetic. So we want to. Solve the alphabetic. This is his claim. So you got M and the I and the A under the two H's, the L and the C. Okay. Now like the last time, we can conclude that this is 10. I'm not going to dwell on that. C and the L are 1 and 0. So we got a, this. And the C and L don't repeat. They, they're nowhere else. So that makes things a little bit more, more difficult. Right. Now, <clears throat> you got four I's here and you got three S's. 
But this four eyes is a, is a place where to, where, where to start. When you're adding this number to this number to this number, the ending is the same number. So what are the possibilities for I? So it could be zero or five. You think I could be zero? Or five. All right, the zero is taken out, right? Could be five, 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 five. But then we don't know, we might be carrying over. You see, you've got three S's here. You might have to carry one. Like for instance, if I had three sixes here, then I'll have to carry one and add it to this. So if we don't have three I's, the sum of the three I's and an I's, we actually got, it's three I, ends an I, or three I plus one ends an I, or three I plus two. You can have a carryover of two as well. If I had eight, 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 then I'll have to carry over two. But that's as far as you can go. So now the question is now, when you say ends in I, what does it mean? It means that three I plus one three I plus one is a two digit number. It's going to be equal to ten plus I. Ends in I, right? Or it could be 20 plus I. Or it may be a number which is bigger than two. But now when you try to solve for that, you will see that if three I plus one is equal to 10, then when you try to solve, you see you got two I is equal to nine. Or two I is equal to 20 minus one, which is 19. In either case, it doesn't work because I, two I equals nine and two I equals 19 doesn't have a solution. Right? Because nine is odd, not even. So it can't be three I plus one. Could be three I plus two. So let's try that. Three I plus two ends in I so you're going to have, it's equal to 10 plus i or 20 plus i. All right, so you could, you, you could have that you're carrying over two. If you carry over two, then you get two plus i plus i, which is three i plus two. Ends in i, you can say it's equal to 10 plus i or 20 plus i. So in this case, you have two i equals eight, so you have i equals four here. Or, and here you have three i, or you have i equals nine. You can have that situation, right? Now, i equals nine is out, oh yes, because this is nine here, sorry. That has to be nine, right? So i equals nine is out. So then you have i is equal to four and you can try i equals four. And look for s's and seven m's, I, I did it. And I found that you can't find solutions. I'm not gonna do it, but you can check it out, check. i equals four gives no solutions. See, if you put i equals four, uh, let me just do that. You have nine h four s. This is his claim.
<coughs> now remember in this case here yeah, i equals 4 right so 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 what are you going to put here you're going to put um, you're going to put something which carries over i think when we, when we did i equals 4 we carried over 2 You remember, I carried over one didn't work, so you carried over two. In which case, we 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 uh, when you carry over two, you're gonna have three sevens. But three sevens wouldn't work because three sevens will end. You got twenty-one, so that doesn't work. So that would carry over two. You'll have to put a seven here, and if you carry over, if you, if you, then the other one will be. It can't be a nine. It can't be eight either because three eights would be twenty-four, and we already got a four. See, so it turns out that four doesn't give you a solution. Okay, so for with four, you have no solution. So the only case will be where you have there's no carry over. Right? As long as if you, if 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 you had to carry over, then we have a problem. So okay, so there's no carry over. So we have uh, this his his claim. We got a nine here. H. Oh, there was yeah. We had S's. Okay, we can we can still put. Oh, H. I. We still don't know what I is. This is his claim. So what will S be? So wouldn't the only option for I be five? Well, the only option op option for, for I will be five now. Yeah, you're quite right. I will have to be five. Okay, so we have eliminated the the others. So I is five. Thanks for that. So I can put I equals five. Right. So what? What will S be? Two. Why? Why two? Because it has to end in a single digit. It could be one, two, or three. We can't put one. We can't put one. Three. Why can't you put three? Because it'll end in nine. Yeah, then it's nine. So this is the only possible thing here is two. Right. That's quite correct. And I'll leave the rest to you. Okay. Okay, I I won't take the fun out of your ending of this thing here. So you got twos here, and we're almost there, and we can go on with the next problem. All right, now we're going to the next problem, which is Oh, the, uh, so the, here's the answer. You can you 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 can check the answer. It's ten thousand seven hundred and fifty-six. Okay, but do, do it. It's 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 very easy after that. You just try certain numbers and eliminate them because if they are repeated, you uh, you don't use them.
Now, question five. Did you know if A, B, C, D is a rectangle and P is a point in its interior, you got to figure that A, B, C, D is a rectangle and P is a point inside it, then any point, random point, then you got four distances and this says here that AP squared, uh, let me use my arrow, AP squared plus CP squared, so this squared plus this squared equals that squared plus that squared, BP squared plus DP squared. So what's the answer to this question? This question here? <laughs> Only you know. It's either yes or no. Did you know? And your answer would be yes or no. So I don't know what the answer is. It depends on whether you knew it or not, and the answer is yes. <laughs> I remember reading something. This guy was going to um, take, he was had come to a quiz competition, and he was at the highest level. And, uh, and he was going to win a large sum of money. Uh, 100,000 rand or whatever. And the, and, the, and the quiz master asked, do you know the height of the highest building in Russia to the nearest centimeter? This guy thought and thought and thought. And he said, no. And this guy said, exactly, you are one because you didn't know and you answered correctly. So you must be very careful when you say, did you know? Now, I want to prove this thing here. Let's see. Uh, why this is so, and you can actually prove it. It's, it's in my book. Some way, it's one of the things that I prove in my book. If you go through the thousand problems, you will see that one of the problems is this particular problem. Uh, but we'll, we'll try to do it together. Let's, let's, uh, uh, my rectangle there in place. And then I've got a point P inside here. Let's choose that point. And you draw these four lines. I want to prove that this squared plus this squared equals that squared plus that squared. How do you do it? I'll give you a hint. The, the, you have to have a construction. You have to draw two lines. That's your hint. What lines do you think you have to draw? See, I've got PA squared. So you need to have right angle triangles. And one way of constructing right angle triangles is to just draw a right angle triangle through this. You draw a complete line that you can get PB squared also. And here, sorry, this is supposed to be going through this intersection. So you, you draw those lines and then P A squared is equal to, we'll call this A and we call this B, is equal to A squared plus B squared. Right? Because this is, we draw parallel lines. It's just, in order to complete these, Lines parallel to the to, to the sides of the rectangle. So you've got you've got a right angle triangle. A PB squared 
there's a B here. So let's call this part here C. So B, B, P, B squared is B squared plus C squared. All right, then now we'll go to P, C squared. Well, P, C squared, well, this is C. So let's call this part here D. So P, C squared is C squared plus D squared. And finally, you got P, D squared. Okay, you already got A and D, so you got A squared plus D squared. So you apply right angle triangle to Pythagoras four times, but you give names to these pieces here, A, B, C, D, like this. And now, P, A squared plus P, C squared. That's what we had, this squared plus this squared. Right? When you join them together, you get a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. That's p a squared plus p c squared. p a squared plus p c squared. And the other one is p b squared plus p d squared. So those are these remaining ones. And when you check that out, you will see you get the same thing. a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. See, you know, that's, that's the proof that either way, you'll have that the sum of these two is equal to it's actually equal to the sum of the squares of all these four things here, a squared plus b squared. There's a b here. So it's a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. Okay, so that's the proof that, uh, so now you know, right? Yeah, the answer should be yes to the first question. Uh, we now know that Okay, let me just uh, get out of this share, get to my question. Okay, so what is the problem now? The problem is this one here. Let's say, you got another rectangle and you got a point inside here and you got these four lines as we saw before, two of them are given, seven, eight, but these two are not given. And yeah, you know, sorry, this is the, I should have gone to the question. I was going, going to the answer. And you are asked to calculate the area of this triangle, yeah, this right angle triangle. Now they, are, they tell you in addition that this angle is 90 degrees. And you got these three sides are given, seven, eight, and square root of 17, those three are given. You got a right angle triangle here, and they ask you to calculate the area of this. All right, so let me go to my whiteboard again. And let me draw my rectangle and uh, see what comes out of that. Um, But there's a right angle triangle here somewhere. So let's just draw the right angle triangle. Uh, what happened here? It's not drawing for some reason. Oh, there we go. It's 
sorry about this you know the technology is very nice but sometimes we don't know how to use it oh god sorry just bear with me while i get this act in order oh uh, sir yes you can help me oh uh, there's an app called geogebra it's way easier yeah but i don't have that and i'm not used to that i i i i use sketchpad uh but it, what i know you 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 mentioned that in uh, in the what chat if column. you use the inbuilt paint ops app like i said all right so now so this is where we are i've i've, I've drawn what i wanted to draw and uh, this is not a straight line So if I remember correctly, they got the the, the numbers were given as seven six seven n square root of seventeen. So this is six, this is seven, square root of seventeen. So what is seven and eight? Oh, seven and eight. Okay, thank you. Seven and eight. Seven and eight. Thank you, Ma. You are such a great help. Okay, so. Seven. The, the, there are seven, and this is eight. Uh, now I've lost the other thing. <laughs> My God. Where is this other screen? Let me just stop share. Sorry, sorry about this. I better get my thinking cap on here. Let's let's have a look at this now. Okay, now I've got the other one. All right, I'm going to get to the eraser and take this thing out and make the seven and eight. Uh, oh, that is why I don't like to use whiteboard. It's just, it's, it takes such a long time. I'd rather just work on the original screen. Okay, but these things there's a lot of calculations involved in this. So, all right, now we need to find the area of this triangle here. We can find the area of this triangle. If I know the base, two sides of the triangle, then the area is half AB. Okay, so I need to work out half AB. That's remember the goal. I put a question mark there to know to show that that is where I am going to. Now you say, well, how do I proceed from here? Well, can I write some equations down? Help me, please. Do we know any equations? Yes. Tell me. A P squared plus D P squared. Okay. Yeah. Equals... Use the symbols A B, the 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 ones which are on the on the picture. B squared plus A squared. B squared plus no eight squared. Yeah, sixty four. No A squared. No, no, no. It was that squared plus that squared. Oh, you are you are looking at Pythagoras. We're looking at okay. the, yeah. B B squared plus A squared. Okay, I'll accept that. B squared plus A squared is equal to seventeen. Somebody wanted to say something. All right, B squared plus A squared is equal to seventeen. And any other equation? B squared plus A squared, no, B squared plus sixty four equals B squared plus forty nine. Forty nine plus A squared. 
one of you have got your mics on and and there are people who are talking in the background can you just check just check that out please because there is this this external disturbance which is coming in okay so you got b squared plus 64 equals 49 so i can take 64 minus 49 put the numbers on the side 64 minus 49 is equal to a squared minus b squared So a squared minus b squared is 64 minus 49, which is 15. So there it is. You got two equations and two unknowns, and you can solve for them. Right? If you add the b squared cancel off, and you get b squared to a squared equals 32. A squared is 16. A is 4. And if you put a is equal to 4 here, you got. Uh, Four squared is sixteen. B B squared is equal to one, and B is equal to one. So this is four, and this is one, and you got the area. Area is half base times height, which is two. So you can use that information that we just proved, and then you can also use Pythagoras. Get two equations, solve for a and b, and that will allow you to work out the area. So the goal is to find a and b, which are the two sides of this right angle triangle. Okay, so let me see now where which number are we in, and uh, we don't have much time. It's almost twelve. I don't want to abuse the privilege that you gave me the last time. So let's uh, just get back to my okay, stop share. <clears throat> What was the last question that we did? Just for my benefit. So ne next time when we come, we are going to go to problem uh, six. So we 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 just done five problems today. We, we we did eight problems today. So it was a rather slow goings, and next week we're going to do ten problems. Um, hopefully we can finish that. But if we don't, we'll just slip into the fourth lecture. So uh, it, all right. But 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 just one just just one thing before I close up. I want to just say a couple of things. Um, About the last talk that we had, you know, when we did 2018, there are some things which I didn't do well there. This was this was fine. This was fine. This was fine. Yeah, this wasn't too bad. This wasn't too bad as well, I think. Yeah, this rain gauge. You know, I rushed through this one. All right. Um, I just want to say some things about this. You see, this rain gauge problem. I'm not going to discuss the statement of the problem again, because you already uh, have seen the problem. But what happened here was that you've got a rain gauge which has got a, a square base. Or maybe we, should, we shouldn't use this. So we got we got a square base. and then it comes down like this and then there's another line at the, on the other side 
And at the same time, you have a prism, which has got a similar kind of a thing. The dimensions of the prism are the same. Let's say it's 100. The square has got 100 sides and the height is 300. Okay, this is not very accurate, but it's something like that. Okay. Now, what I wanted to say was that the volume of this is, you've got 100, 100 here and the height is, height is 300. The height is 300. The volume of this is one third the area of the base, which is 100 times 100, which is 10 to the power of 4, times the height, which is 300. And 1 third 300 is 100. 3 is cancelled, and you have 10 to the power of 6. That's the volume of this. And therefore, the volume of this must be 3 times that, because area of base times height and the area of the base times height is the volume of this entire thing. So this volume here is one third the volume of this. So we know the volume of this, see? You pour all this into the stuff here and you know that it, its volume will only occupy one third of this. So because the volume of this is one third. So, so the height will be, after pouring this, the height of this water inside here, the liquid, will be only one third of 300. So the height will be 100. That you can do that mentally because the area of the base is still the same, you see. And the volume of this a prism of height 100 for the same base is the same as one third the volume of that prism, which is equal to the volume of that. Now, that's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing that I wanted to say was that when you scale. The, the second part of the problem had something like this. You got a kind of half a pyramid. What has happened here is that the sides of the square became half that, that side. See? And the height is half that height. Now you scale this whole thing down by a half. Now when you scale a volume by half, the entire volume is scaled by half cubed, one eighth. And to see why, you see, this part here becomes half the side. So when you're squaring it, it's half a side times half the other side, which is a quarter of that area, half times half. So this area here is a quarter that, that because each one is half and the height is half. So it will be one eighth. So the volume of this will be one eighth the original volume. So therefore, when you pour this stuff here into this without making any further calculations, this height here will be one eighth the height of this, see? And that gives you 12 and a half straight away. So you, you can actually solve this problem mentally. Okay, think about that. So that is what I wanted to say there. And the other one, which I didn't finish off nicely, or maybe some others, um, If you go back to my to the paper, uh, and we went further down, yeah, this one here I was very sloppy in this. But the way to do this is, I told you after six moves you come back to this. Now watch, watch what the six moves are. You can actually imagine it. I'll flip this thing one to the right, and follow the red, the red square. The red square, when you flip it to the right, the red square is on your left-hand side. Then you flip it down here to this. The red square is still on the left-hand side. And again, you flip it to this part, and the red square is still on your left-hand side. Right? 
Now you bring it back to that line. When you bring it back to that line, the red square, which is the left-hand side, will go to the top. So at this position here, it's exactly the same as that position. The red square is the top. Now you flip it in that direction. And what happens is that the red square is on the opposite side now. And when you flip it one more, the red square gets to the bottom. See? I'll say this again. Red square is on the right. Red square is on the right. Red square is on the right. And here, the red square goes to the top. And here, the red square goes to the back. And here, the red square goes to the bottom. So in six moves, you can get this. Now, the second part here, which I was taking pains to explain, it's impossible. And I think a lot of people uh, had this, uh, were suggesting this, but a, but a very good proof, and I told you, you color this as a chessboard. And there's, there's your argument. You see, originally, this thing is on a certain square. Now imagine you, 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 you painted this thing as a chessboard. So you got blacks and whites, which are next to each other. Right? Black, white, black, white, black, white, and so on. Right? So let's assume that this original square was on, the, 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 the cube was on a black square. Right. Now here's a rub. Each time you move this thing one time, right? The square, when you, when, you, when, you, when you flip it over, then the square now is sitting on a white square. The entire square, don't worry about the red. The entire square is now sitting on a white square. And when you move it again, the entire square is sitting on a black square. See, each time you move it, the color changes. The color of the, don't worry about the red, the color of the bottom of the square changes. Right? And you'll have to move it twice for the color to come back to the original. So each time you move it once, the color changes. And you move it once more, it comes back to the original. So in other words, each, the, 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 then you are back to black, black square. Now again, you do the same thing, and the color changes and it comes to black. In other words, each time you, you, if you move it an odd number of times, the color changes. And if you move it an even number of times, the color remains the same. And there's a question. The question is, when it comes back to the original, the color remains the same. It is sitting on the same color. And that is why it has to be an even number of moves. Because each time you move it, you are uh, changing the color, right? And that is the proof of it. It's a perfectly proof except uh, thing. So it, it, it doesn't matter about, you know, what moves you make. It's, it's, it's just that you uh, argue it like this. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to say that because I, I, I messed it up the last time when I did this. This, this wasn't a bad problem. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And um, you, if you haven't got the, the thing, I'm going to actually show you the chat. While there, I, I can see the other chats. Oh, yeah, the, the, the uh, is, is there anybody who didn't write down the, 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 the link? To the book. All right, it looks as if everybody got, got to the link of the book. I think while you are still here and the Huawei is here, I'll just show you the book so you can see how it works quickly. Um, Yeah, would the recorded link be available later? That's when I when I send the solutions. Uh, when I send the um, recording, then it'll be there. Now, here's the book. Can, can you all see the book? Yes. Yeah. Now, like for instance, now suppose now I wanted to see something on inequalities. 
So what I do is I click on the book and I press Control F. It's a normal kind of a thing. Uh, Control F in, in, in Word. And you type in inequalities. Oh, I spelled it wrongly. And then I search for this thing, press enter, and it'll, it'll take me to uh, any page which has got uh, inequalities in it. It is still searching, it took me a long time. Okay. Let me try P451. Oh, it's taken a long time because I've got a lot of things open. Oh, there's your inequalities. Now you see, I got a whole lesson on inequalities. And that lesson is on page 252. So if I now type 252 on the page, It'll take me straight to that lesson. Two fifty. I don't know what happened, but that's two fifty two inequalities. Uh, the reason why I did that was the last question on two nineteen. They talk about these th these three things here. So I want you to read through this lesson on inequalities. If you got the book, lesson seven, very very interesting things on 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 different kinds of means. You see, this is the average of two. If you got any two numbers, you can create various kinds of averages, and one of them is called the arithmetic mean, which is your normal average, right? Then there's a geometric mean, which is you multiply the numbers and you find the square root, and this harmonic mean which occurs in music. It's two consecutive notes in music. Uh, the, 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 the notes are not exactly halfway spaced. They are spaced in according to a certain way. And this is the formula that is used. That is why they call it the harmonic mean. The, 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 that note is, it harmonizes with the other two notes. So, so you got these, these are uh, the, the different kinds of uh, things. And there's a lot of, a lot of interesting relationships between all these, which you can go to. All right, now, if, if, if I were to go to P451, now P451 means problem 451. So there's problem 451. The problem says, if 12 over X is a natural number and X is a natural number, how many possible values are there for X? Right, now, now I have to put P because P means problem, right? But if I want to go to the solution, I can either type S451, which is solution 451, or just click on this. See, it goes straight to the solution. X will have to be a factor of 12 and so on and so forth, right? And if I wanted to go back to 451, if I went to this L2, this will be a lesson which will help you to solve this problem. You see? No, 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 I'm sorry. This is level two. This is a very easy problem, level two. So if you, in your case now, you should be looking for level four or level five problems. You know, say, say level four. Uh, see, these are area problems here. See? Like I think this is a game problem. So if you, uh, a little bit of geometry here. Now look at this. this, this is a rather complicated geometry problem. And when you try to do this, you'll have, you, know, you, may, you may get stuck. Then what you do here is, it's a level four problem. So it's a rather difficult problem. And this is meant for seniors, by the way, so don't worry about this particular one. But if I click on this number here, it goes to 8.10.7. And here you've got a theory 
which will help you to solve the problem. He says, okay, a Serbian and so on and so on, he tells you, he gives you some nice interesting facts about areas of triangles and so on. And it says the area of this triangle over the area of this triangle is BD over DC, you know, the area of ABD. So you've got a beautiful theory here, which can be very useful to solve that problem. And you've got another theory, a bisector of an angle divides the area in the same ratio and so on and so forth. So there's some interesting results on areas at, in, in that lesson, see? So it's like that now, you can go to any question, you know, you like and try to solve it. But you can't put, if you just put 506, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't uh, take you to the problem. But if you put P506, then it'll take you to problem 506 and you can have a look at it. See, uh, so you can scroll down, you can, you can find things, you can get into lessons and so on. And uh, it'll help you a great deal to uh, get far more problems than what, what we are doing here. And more than that, you can read through the lessons and it'll, it'll give you a lot of muscle to learn enough mathematics. So some of you people who are in still grade nine, if you uh, start now and go through all these lessons, by the time you come to grade 11 or grade 12, you'll be there in the top 10, I can tell you that. But you must be diligent, try, the, you got 1000 problems, right? you're not gonna go through the whole lot, but just try the more high level problems and, 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 and go ahead. And if you want to look for problems only in geometry, for instance, you can do that also because I've got an index which tells you you get, get to the book, study it from the beginning. It gives you lots of tables to tell you how to pick up all problems on averages, or otherwise all problems on Pythagoras' theorem. And you can go to the whole, all the numbers will be given in one, one particular place and you can go straight to it. Okay, so I'm, I just thought I'll tell you how to use the book while, while we had a little bit of time. Okay, do you have any questions? There were 29 people who remained behind, so. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I was wondering where I can get this book. Yeah, that's the, that's the link that I the, that I uh, that I had. Okay, I, 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 I'll, I'll I'll write it down again. So then, it's being sold. It, it, it's being sold by South African Maths Foundation, but it's an ebook, and they got the copyright to it. Uh, let me just write it again on the whiteboard so you can see it. So this is the link that you have to have to go to. So it says there's only soft copies, there's no hard copies. There are there are hard copies as well. I think they've got a limited number of hard copies. Uh, but you can find out. Um, I think the art copy may be a little bit more expensive than the, the, the than the digital copy. If I recall the the price of the book, this is www dot right? That's your Sam F. And then you have to type E N. And then after that you type Mathematics Olympiad Problems. With a dash in between, important. So is the dash or underscore? Uh, let me just see. We can try it. It's not, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a dash. You know, like bypass. Um, okay. Have you got it? So that's 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 the link you go to, and uh, I'm just going to stop share now and get out of this. I thought I might actually demonstrate to you uh, how to do it on the screen, but it's going to be difficult. But just type the thing and just follow the links. You guys are much better than that uh, than me on this. 
Okay. Are there any other questions? Many of you are quite silent. You don't you don't respond. Uh, only some people, like Mehmet, you know, you're brave, brave enough, and uh, my uh, good friend Andreas, who is extremely brave and wants to say something all the time. But participate when I ask you a question. You must come in. Renono was very very early here. He was the first person five minutes before. He was already sitting and waiting. Okay. And so, Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, all right then. Have enjoy the rest of the weekend, guys, and I'll see you again on Thursday, next week Thursday at the same time. No, at at yeah at, at four o'clock, and uh, we will continue with the last ten problems. But in the meantime, you can try working those twenty ten problems for twenty nineteen, and also twenty twenty because we're going to tackle some of the problems in the twenty twenty. One no, but actually, yeah, 2020, 2020 was last year. They didn't have a third round because of the of COVID, so they only had round two. So in 2020, you have to go to round two problems. So, so 2020 was not as difficult as the previous years because there were only two rounds. Okay. If there are no more questions, then we will close up the session. Thank you very much. Thank you for the lesson. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Okay, bye. Thank you too. Bye, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Almaz, are you there? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Almaz, you, are you the one who often speaks? Yes, sir. Oh, how's uh, Faisal? What's he doing these days? Sir, well, sir, he does a lot of work, sir, and he's always studying. But is he in, still in high school or is he in, going to university? So he's, in, he's in grade 11. Oh, he's in grade 11? Oh, uh, okay. He's he's a bright boy. Uh, Faisal Ghani. I, now, are, are you from Polokwane? Yes, sir. Now, how's my good friend um, Wally? Uh, what's his name? I don't know whether he's still there. He was in Polokwane. Uh, and he was one of the first persons to uh, teach uh, Olympiad problem. I'm sure your, 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 your father knows him, your parents know him. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I have lost track of him. I hope he's still living. He's a wonderful person. When I came to the University of Limpopo, he invited me to his house and I think I met his family and he had a son who was also doing a very bright boy. I've forgotten his name now. Um, we, we, he's, we used to call him Wally. Anyway, uh, try to find out from your father if he knows, remembers a Wally, who was a mathematics man in Polokwane. Um, and he, he might lead me on to him. I'd like to talk to him after all these years. All right. You take care, Almas. Are there any other Ghanis? How, how, how are the, uh, what, the what is related to you? Uh, so they're my first cousins. My mother's twin. Sisters, children. Oh, hey, there's a lot of mathematics in your family, yeah? <laughs> All of you are like, when you'll get together, family get together, you don't sit at the dinner table. You'll go and sit on a table and look at, work out problems. <laughs> All right, you take care now. Bye. You too, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye.